urban ministry. Hello. Hello. You know, oftentimes when speakers come to these things, they always start out by saying, I'm so happy to be here. And usually, we're lying. Usually, I'd rather be somewhere else. Usually, frankly, I'd rather be home. But tonight, I'm really happy to be here. And, and, and I, hope, I hope you're happy to be here. I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it feels great. Does it not feel great to be in this room? I, I, I'm so, the thing is, and for, for some, some of you are new to this ball game, but for some of you have been working with kids in the city for a while, and you come to something like this, and it just, you feel, you feel so validated. You feel so appreciated. You feel like somebody notices what you're doing. <laughs> and, and, and that's a great thing. I mean, it just for me, it's great to be in a room with hundreds of people who get it. You know what I mean? You know, who know what it's like to lead a kid to Christ one day and have him rob you the next. <laughs> Understand what it's like to drive a van that shouldn't be driven. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are these people. You know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I don't want to... I used to, I, I spent a summer one time working down in Newport Beach. Ooh, yeah, baby. <laughs> South Coast Community Church. And I, wor I, wor I had worked the summer before in a low-cost housing project in Philadelphia. When I got to this church in Newport Beach, I was supposed to be at church at 9 o'clock every Sunday to leave Sunday school, but I always got there an hour early just because it was so exciting to me to watch the cars come into the parking lot. <laughs> so, I'd never seen cars, Jaguars and Porsches like in your parking lots, <laughs> if your kids can find one. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, there are, you're in a room now with people who get it. And, and, and the great thing, part of the good thing about being here is we're surrounded by people who get it. The other part of the good thing is, is that we left at home all the people in our churches who don't get it. <laughs> and so it's, it's good to be together. And, 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 you know, I, I, I'm supposed to be preaching some spiritual sermon. And you've probably figured out already it's not likely to happen. But, <laughs> but, but, but what I can do, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little older now, is I can give you some good advice. And my advice to you this weekend, at the beginning of this weekend, is this. Savor it. Drink it up. En enjoy this time. I mean, I know, I know some of you all, you're all type A, you know, you got to have notes, and you're going you're gonna to learn a lot, and you got to, you know, redeem the time, and uh, yeah, it's all good. But in the process of going to every seminar twice, I just want you to enjoy yourself. Enjoy the music. Enjoy the fellowship. Enjoy, enjoy being surrounded by good people like this. And, 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 and the other thing, don't apologize for enjoying it. Because you know, some of you are so guilt-driven that even though you're up here, you're like, I'm up here and this is good and everything, but you know, I should be home doing evangelism. <laughs> There's kids out there that need Jesus and I'm sitting up here. Sitting up. Don't apologize. Don't feel guilty. You're supposed to be here this weekend. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And I want to I tell you, not only do I want you to enjoy it, but I don't want you to let anybody make you feel bad for enjoying it. Because there are people that will do that. There are always people, when, when you get, you come to things like this, and you know, the, the worship's great, you know, and it's like, you know, it's better than the worship back home for most of us, you know. We don't have, you know, guys with guitars, goatees and really cool clothes. You know, we don't have that back home. And so for a lot of us, what happens is, is that we get high at these things. You know, we get, we get emotionally up and, 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 and it's great. And there's always somebody that comes around and goes, well, that's all, that's all good and well, but you know, 
That's just an emotional high you're on. I mean, that's great. Those mountaintop experiences are fine, but, you know, they don't really, that's all they are. They're mountaintop experiences. You're just emotional. You're being carried away by your emotions. And you know what? When people say to you, like, you know, it's an emotional high. You know, so what? I like emotional highs. Right? I mean, there's a part of our faith that is built on knowledge and, try, you know, the word. And, the, and part of our faith is emotion. And it's great. And it, so you say, it's an emotional high. So what? I like them. You say, oh, it won't last. It won't last. I know. A couple years ago, it was funny. A friend of mine was uh, doing a, a, a revival. He said a revival means down in the south. Now, 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 and I mean the south on the east coast south, not like Mexico. I mean... I'm talking like Alabama, okay? <laughs> and they do these revivals where, where they'll have church for a whole week. Every, every night they got the revival service, and, and, and he was the revivalist. And so he was down there doing, doing his revivalist thing. And, and, you know, and what you do is on these things, the, you, 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 every night you do an invitation. Every night. And, and, and you don't expect much the first couple nights because the smart people, the experienced revival people, know, like, you don't come forward till the last night. You know, that's the biggie. And so he didn't expect. So he's doing this. So the first night, he's doing this revival, and only one guy comes forward. This guy comes forward, and he kneels down at the altar, and the guy throws his arms in the air, and he starts yelling, Fill me, Jesus. Oh, fill me, Lord. Fill me, Jesus. And the pastor of the church tapped my friend on the shoulder and said, He does it every year. He said, he said You watch. He'll be forward every night. Same act. Fill me, Jesus. He said, he, every year he gets saved, and every year he goes out of here, and he is the worst guy in town. I mean, he beats people up. He cheats in his business. He's lousy to his wife. He neglects his kids. He's just the biggest jerk. He said, but he'll be here every night. Sure enough, my friend said, every night of the service, every night after the service, guy came, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Jesus. The last night of the revival, the guy's up in front, and he's doing his thing. He's way into it. Fill me, Jesus. Scream at the house. Fill me, Jesus. And this little old lady in the back of the church stands up and yells, don't do it, Lord. <laughs> she, said, she said, don't do it. He leaks. <laughs> hey, you know what? We all leak, don't we? Yeah, we all leak. We come to these things and we get all filled up and we're all and we leak it away. You say it doesn't let, so it, it's, it's okay. It's not so it, 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 it's 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 not supposed it's not it's not how it's supposed to work. It's not the point. The point isn't that that you should live in this emotional high. You don't believe me? I got I got a story. Jesus, a Jesus story. People talk about mountaintop experience. I'll tell you a mountaintop experience. Transfiguration. You know that story? Now that's a mountaintop experience. I mean, right, it says right there, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up to? Mountaintop, high mountain, okay. And you know what happens, right? Jesus takes him up there. Peter, James, and John, his three inside guys, right? And they go up on the mountain. And there they are up there, right? And all of a sudden it says, there, they were all alone. There Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white. Ah. <laughs> Whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. I like that, you know, just in case you're wondering, how white? Well, you, whiter than anyone could bleach them. <laughs> and there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking to Jesus. So you're, you, I mean, can you imagine this? You're Peter, James, John. You're walking up there with Jesus, and all of a sudden, boom, he's glowing. And there's Elijah, and there's Moses, right? Elijah representing the prophets. Moses representing the law. And they're talking to Jesus, and, and you say, wow, this is amazing. It couldn't get any better than this. And then it does. <laughs> but before it does, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Peter had an amazing grasp of the obvious. 
And then Peter says something really, I mean, in some sense, you, you go, gosh, Peter said something stupid. Every serious story in the Bible, Peter says something stupid. Like, that, you know, you're like, oh, it's a Bible story. Peter will say something stupid. And he says, let us put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And you go, that is ridiculous. And the, and, and, and the Bible says in parentheses, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. <laughs> I love that. Let's build a camp, okay? I said you stupid. So they're up there, and there's Elijah, and there's Moses, and then all of a sudden, out of the clouds, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. I mean, can you imagine that? You're up there with Jesus. He's glowing. Elijah and Moses are there, and then God's voice booms. You say, wow, that's a high. <laughs> Suddenly, when they looked around, though, they no longer saw anyone except Jesus. You see, you see why did he take them up there? It wasn't going to last. It wasn't going to last. And you know what? When Jesus took Peter, James, and John up there, not only did he know it wasn't going to last, but he knew that they wouldn't get it, <laughs> that they wouldn't understand it. They, he knew that James and John, a few weeks later, would be arguing over who gets to ride shotgun in heaven. You know, <laughs> no, I get to sit. No, I get to sit there. He knew that Peter would deny him three times. I mean, he didn't think like, if I can just get him up here for this experience, it's that's that, that'll do it. He knew it wouldn't last. He said, well, if he knew it wouldn't last, then why did he take? It was still great. It was just a great thing. Coming down from the mountain, they didn't, they didn't understand it. They're still trying to work it out. Well, now why do they say about Elijah? And what are you talking about? They're, so they're coming down the mountain, you see, after the greatest mountaintop experience of all time. And they're trying to figure it out. And as they're coming down the mountain, it says, Jesus gets hit with a problem right away. I mean, he ain't even, he ain't even down. He ain't even got home yet. Said, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus tells them, don't tell them. And they're all trying to figure it out. And there's, you know, who's Elijah and all this stuff. And then when they came to the other disciples, it says, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing about, says Jesus. I mean, can you imagine this? You have, if you're Jesus, you have just taken your buddies up for the biggest high of all time. You're coming down, you come down, and what? Your disciples are fighting with the Pharisees again. You're going to talk about a, 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 just a, what a bummer. <laughs> Jesus gets, as soon as this high is over, Jesus gets hit with a problem. You say, why are you telling me that? Because so will you. I mean, I hope you have a good time this weekend. Yeah, because I got to tell you, <laughs> when you go home, it's going to be all messed up. <laughs> you, you, I mean, I hope you make it home. Before the phone rings. Because I guarantee you walk in your house, the whole phone will be ringing. You know, Joey's in jail, right? You know? Billy's house burned down. She was going to have another one. You know? I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it just my kids? Now you say, well, why are you telling me that? Why, why are you telling me? Because it's not that I'm trying to depress you. I'm just trying to prepare you. Because sometimes when you get into a situation like this one, you know, everybody's talking so up about God. Things are going to be different. God's going to change us here this weekend. You know, I, I'm here to tell you that mountaintop experiences are great, but you want a piece of advice? Be prepared for trouble because mountaintops are great, but they don't change anything. They don't change anything. I, I, now, don't get me wrong. I know I sound unspiritual. You're saying, gosh, why didn't he, why didn't he bring a spiritual guy here? That, he doesn't change anything. <laughs> but the, some of you are old hands at this, but some of you are young. And you come to something like this, and here's the thing I've got to tell you is, no matter how good the seminar goes, no matter how much you think, oh, now I get it. When you get home, life at home doesn't work the way they tell about it in the seminar. <laughs> right? They tell you, you say this. And then the kid will say that, and then you respond this way, and he'll fall on his knees and say, praise God, thank you.
and you say this, and the kid punches you in the mouth, and it's over. I mean, this, don't get me wrong. The seminars are great. You will learn great stuff. I have seen who is coming here, and I will tell you something. You don't know some of these people. They have, these are wonderful people who know their stuff. There's great stuff here. And not just from the seminar leaders. Just talk to the other people. Just talk to some of the old heads here. They, they, There's stuff. And the stuff is great, but it doesn't change everything. See, I don't want I to break it to you, but no matter how much you learn here, you're going to be the same person when you go home that you were when you got up here. I mean, chances are, I mean, I mean, chances are you, you came up here one, chances are you're probably going to be much the same when you go home. You're not going to suddenly be all worshipful like David Crowder, you know? <laughs> You're not going to suddenly have, you're not going to suddenly be confident like Larry Acosta. Hey! <laughs> you're not going to suddenly have all the answers. You're not going to suddenly have figured out the mysteries of youth ministry all in one weekend. It's not going to happen like that. You're not going to all of a sudden be these superstar youth workers. And you know what? You're not going to be like all the superstar youth workers you see here. And you know what? Neither are they. Neither are they. It's all a show. <laughs> now, you see, that's the problem with young Christians. That's the problem with us, is that we think that because somebody can articulate a truth, that means that they're living it out. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm going to tell you something. Some of you younger youth workers are in awe of people because you're buying the stuff they're telling you about their prayer life and their spiritual life and their, oh, I have thought, you know, and they're not telling the whole truth. <laughs> Just because somebody can talk about it. I talk about stuff. I can talk about stuff even I don't know about. I'm a professional talker. I, and I, I grew up in a family, of my father's a professional talker. Any of you hear my father? Yeah. Right. Now, if you have my father is like the greatest preacher I've ever heard. Man can tell a story. Some of his stories. You ever hear that one like about the prostitutes in Hawaii? Isn't that a great story? Oh, yeah. He has these great stories. I went to, I said, I said, Dad, where do you get those stories? Stuff like that never happens to me. Where, where do you get that story? He said, you know, you have to really, God, just, you just have to be spiritual. <laughs> a couple weeks later, right, he and I go out to lunch at this diner, right? We're at the diner, and the waitress comes by, and he's always goofy with the waitress. Hey, what's your name? You know, and she's talking and stuff like that. And, and you know, he says, oh, I, I've been there. You know, and she says, oh, why were you there? Oh, I was preaching in some church. You know, I have a little conversation. She goes off, right? It was fine. It was a nice little encounter. Week after that, I'm in church listening to him preach. And all of a sudden, he starts telling this story. And I was in this diner, and I looked into this young woman's eyes, and I saw emptiness. I saw the hurt and the pain. And he's telling, by the time he's done telling, I'm crying. I'm going, oh, my God. And I was like, wait a second, I was there. figured it out yet. All those stories that you hear us tell, we edit them. We, we cut out the bad parts. We only tell the good stories. We take two stories, we compress them together in one because they work better that way. We don't lie. We remember big. You say, why are you telling me? What I'm telling you is this. Is that the problem with you guys isn't that you're not doing amazing stuff. The problem is you don't know how to tell a good story. <laughs> I guarantee you, I came into your world and walked around with you for two weeks. I would tell your story in a way that would make everybody cry. 
You're in the middle of wonderful stories. See, and you know the other problem with stories is? Is that in the, when you're in the middle of a great story, it isn't a great story. See, when somebody gets done telling a story, and I went to the prison week after week for 17 years, and for 17 years this guy said, get out, get out, get out. And then after 17 years, at one point, he said, you know what, if you keep coming back, and if God's like you, I want to accept it. You know, and it makes a great story. But you know what, in year 16, <laughs> that guy's just sitting home feeling like a failure. Like a lot of us feel like failures. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that you may not know it, but many, many of you are in the middle of great illustrations. You're in the middle of wonderful stories. You're in the middle of miraculous happenings. You just don't know it yet. They don't seem so inspirational in the middle, do they? This story isn't inspirational. Not in the middle of it. Jesus comes down and they're arguing with each other. What are you arguing with them about, he asks. A man in the crowd says, teacher, I brought you my son, who's possessed by a spirit who has robbed him of speech. When it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus comes down. His disciples can't do anything right. Can't even cast out a demon. comes down, you know what he says? He's fed up. Here he comes from the highest of spiritual highs, and he comes down, and nothing's changed, and evil is still working, and people are still inadequate, and everything's still messed up, and Jesus says, oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you people? I mean, he's fed up. He said, man, that sounds like he's just about to say, like, how long do I have to put up with y'all? Next line is, how long shall I put up with you? It isn't a good story. Jesus comes down, his disciples can't do anything right, and he goes, I'm sick of you. How long, how long do I have to take this? How long do I have to stay with people that can't get anything right? And then he pauses and he says, bring the boy to me. See, that's the thing, like, even when Jesus is bummed, even when it feels really crummy to him, he does his job. He does his job. And he expects his disciples to do the, his, their job. And you know what their job is? To bring the boys and girls to Jesus. And you know what your job is and my job is? Is to bring the boys and girls to Jesus. And don't get me wrong. Don't, don't overestimate. It isn't your job to heal them. It isn't your job to save them. It's your job to bring them to Jesus. And that's my, 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 my you know, I, I said I don't have a lot of spiritual stuff, but I got some advice. My advice is here. Do your job. When you get down from here and you realize that life hasn't changed all that much and when you get back in the mess and it is a mess and when you get back in the trouble and it will be trouble and when you get back with kids that don't understand it, just do your job. Your job is to bring people to Jesus. So they bring them to Jesus. And when, and when and then the spirit, this boy is possessed. This boy is possessed by an evil spirit. And when it sees Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. See, sometimes you think if you bring a kid to Jesus, it's over. I, I, it's great. But you know the problem with this kid is? When you bring kids that are possessed by evil spirits to Jesus, it gets worse. Uh, I, I, this is the spiritual truth that I want you to grasp because some of you, what happens in your ministries and my ministries is, is that when things start to go bad, we try to ask ourselves, what's wrong? See, because you know, when people's ministries are thriving and going very well, we go, oh, God must be blessing. God must be blessing that. Oh, God, he's anointed of God. How do you, oh, look at the numbers. Look at the growth. Look at all. You know what? You know what I say? I say when everything's going really bad, that's when you know you're in good shape. I say when the kids start slashing your tires, no, I'm serious. You must be doing something right. Because, you see, evil spirits, they don't bother with people that aren't causing them trouble. Evil spirit, Satan, as long as you sit there and you just run Sunday school in your church with the kids you got and you don't worry about anybody else and you don't try to do anything too radical and you're trying to push anybody in any big direction, you're fine. 
You start to do something, that's when it all comes down hard. I, I'm just, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Just trying to make you be prepared. Because Jesus comes down and there's bad stuff going on and they bring the boy to Jesus and the spirit just starts to hurt him and hurt him and do all this stuff. And, 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 and in the middle of this, Jesus says to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. See, I, I, I'm not an expert. I'm not one of these. I haven't read all the left behind books. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm... I know. I barely made it through Frankie Peretti. And, um, and so I'm not an expert on demons and Satan and evil. Okay? But I do know this much. I do know this much. Satan loves to attack children and young people. And that makes sense. Because if you can wreck a kid when he is young, if you can raise up a child in the way that they should not go, when they are older, they will not depart from it. It's a little paraphrase, but you know what I'm saying? See, what I want you to understand here is, is that those people back home that don't get it, they really don't get it. Because youth ministry, urban youth ministry, is the most significant form of ministry in the entire world. This is where Satan goes after him. I mean, if you want to destroy a generation of young people, if you want to destroy a generation, you don't wait till they're 35. <laughs> Satan's always gone after young people. And you know, a lot of the Christians I know, they don't believe in Satan the way they believe in God. God, they believe, is a, is a, is a personification, a true, a true force of goodness with a personality. And they, don't, they, they have some weird concept of Satan that he's either some, some guy running around in a red suit, kind of somebody to be laughed at and mocked, or just some generalized, you know, just the way of the world. And there is a way of the world, but that's not Satan. Satan is a personality that's, that roams around the world seeking to destroy people's lives. And he, and he attacks different, and just in the same way that God blesses different people different ways because they're made differently, so too Satan attacks different people different ways because they're made differently. And so this, Jesus says to the Father, and boy, that'd be a tough question. How long has he been like this? Because if you're the Father, you know what Jesus' question might, kind of implies? What'd you do to this kid? How long have you been like this? Did you raise him like this? And you know what? As youth workers, we do that, don't we? We look at kids and we go, man, somebody. Somebody's asleep on that job. That's why I want to talk about Satan a little bit. Because I think it's really dangerous to blame parents for the way their kids are all the time. Some of you aren't, you see, some, you're younger youth workers. And so what that means is that you're messing with other people's kids, and you haven't got kids of your own. And so you don't know. I got two kids, and I raise them the same, and they are so different. See, some of the stuff that, 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 that they're about is stuff I put in them, stuff I did to them, stuff I've said to them, stuff my wife and I have done with them, and some of it, it comes from places I don't know. Some of you are smiling because you say, oh, that's funny. Some of you are crying. And I'm not going to tell you which you should do. But I'm here to tell you that there are other forces at work on young people besides what their parents do or don't do. And so as youth workers, you want to be real gentle in the way that you talk to parents and about parents. So man, spirit, I, I, don't, I, I said, I don't got a lot of spiritual stuff, but I got some advice. And I want you to do your job, but while you do your job, you be careful that you recognize that there are evil forces in this world that seek to devour young people. And sometimes you go, oh, that sounds good in church. Yeah, Satan, we hate Satan. That's good. You know what? It also means sometimes you got to let certain people off the hook. And I tell you that now, and it may not mean anything to you, but there may come a time when you need to be let off the hook. And then maybe it'll be good for you. 
His father, he's spiritually sensitive. He knows it wasn't all him. He knows that there was a spirit that did it. He, he doesn't say, I messed him up. He says, the spirit has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. He's a sensitive man, this father. He knows enough that it isn't all his fault, and he knows enough to bring the kid to Jesus. He's sensitive, but he's not sensitive enough because his next line is this. He says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And, then he's, and now he's pushed Jesus too far. If you can, says Jesus. Can, I mean, can you hear the sarcasm on Jesus? If I can, if, if I can do anything, do you know who you're talking to? If I can. Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes me. Jesus, everything's possible for me. Everything's possible. Do you believe that? I wonder. I mean, I know theologically in your, heart, in your heads you believe everything is possible. But tonight as, as youth workers, I want to ask if you believe that. Because I'm convinced when I look at, the, at, at urban youth ministry in this country, as I go around and visit ministries around the country, I'm not sure that people really believe everything is possible. And the reason is because they keep, a lot of us keep running our ministries as if the only thing that is possible is what we've already seen. I'm talking to the older youth workers right now. See, because sometimes it seems to me that we're running these youth ministries the same way that we ran them 10 years ago and 20 years ago, and, and, th and that we're in churches, and we're so locked into traditions. We're so locked into, this is the way we've always done things, and, and that, that in some ways, we, we, don't, it, we act as though we don't really believe everything is possible. And probably the most significant way in which we don't believe everything is possible is, is that we're content to keep spiritualizing the kids we've got. And we're not as concerned as we need to be about the ones that are possessed out there. I, I don't know who I'm talking to here. I, 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 on, I, on this level, I mean, I know somebody in this room is a part of a church right now that is so eagerly, they're, they're doing bold, radical new stuff. They're trying every which way they can to get the kids outside the four walls of their church. They're saying, hey, we're glad. You know what? We want to use our kids to reach other kids. And they're, do and they're, they're in schools and they're in playgrounds and, and they're, they're going to parties and their kids are, and, 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 and they're, they're just, they're boldly going. And some of us are sitting in our little quiet places saying, if you come to us and you want to live like we live and do church like we do church, we're glad to have you. Everybody welcome here. I run this mission year program. We recruit all these young people to spend a year living and working among the poor. Some of them are here. And it's funny, you know, because they're, they're not urban, most of them. They're kids from Iowa, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm in Oakland, cool. <laughs> and you wouldn't think they'd be any good. They're really good. Yeah, and, and, and we put them in churches. And the church people come to me afterwards and they say, we really loved having those kids in our church this year. It's really changed the way we do ministry. And I'm like, what could you possibly learn from a bunch of punk young people from Iowa? <laughs> I mean, seriously, these kids don't know what they're talking about. But you know what we do with them that the churches don't do? We just make them, we send them out door to door a lot of times. We send them out to the laundromat and say, spend a day in the laundromat, just talk to whoever comes in. We do all this really weird stuff. We don't, we don't keep them in the church. We just have them out in the neighborhood. And what I realize is, is that a lot of churches have youth workers that are so excited about ministry, but they don't ever walk out. I don't think it's that they don't care about those kids that are out there. I really don't. And I want you, okay, so if I'm getting in your grill, just, I want you to ask this, this question. Are you not going out there because you don't care? Because that's what people will say about you. Oh, that church, they don't care about the needy kids. Oh, that church, they, there's, is so sad. I don't, come on, you, you, we know each other. We know better than that. You know why we don't go out? Because we don't think anything will happen if we do. We don't really think it's possible that we 
could be relevant to the hardcore kids that are out there. And so Jesus says to you, everything's possible. And the father says, everything's possible for him who believes. And, and you know what the father says? Lord, I believe what? Help thou my unbelief. I believe, but help me unbelief. Isn't that us? Do you believe that God can change the city? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief, because I kind of don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Lord, I believe. He says, help my unbelief. And this is my last little deal. Because I love this guy. Because you know what he is? He's an honest doubter. And Jesus loves an honest doubter. The church does not love honest doubters. The church loves dishonest certain people. God is good. All the time. Yeah, you know what? I don't believe that sometimes. Because it seems to me, I, know, I mean, I know really God is good all the time, but sometimes it doesn't seem like God's being so good to me. Sometimes it doesn't seem like God's being so good to my kids. A little nine-year-old girl gets gang raped in the ghetto. God is good all the time. What does that mean? So what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, God, God loves an honest doubter. And so do the kids. The kids in your youth groups, the kids in your neighborhood, do not need your perfect spiritual witness. There are, Larry and I were talking about this. There are so many youth workers here who feel that they're not qualified to be youth workers because they haven't memorized the Bible and because they, aren't, they don't have their act together and because they haven't quelled all their doubts and because they don't have all their sexuality in check and, and they, you know, because they, they're not perfect in every way that they're disqualified for being in ministry. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that the kids don't need a bunch of perfect Christians. And as a matter of fact, if you convince your kids that you've got your act together, you've totally wrecked their lives. Because if they believe that you've got their act together, if they believe that you're perfect, then they'll believe that Christianity is for perfect people. And as soon as they believe Christianity is for perfect people, they'll know what? It's not for them. You know what your kids need? They need some honest doubters. They need some people who say, you know, I believe some of the time. They need real role models. What I'm they need people who struggle. They need people who talk about their need for forgiveness and not in the past tense. That don't say, yes, I needed forgiveness 20 years ago when I met Jesus. I needed forgiveness and I got it. And I haven't needed it since. <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking about what Jesus did for us 10 years ago. It's time to start talking about what Jesus did for me last, last le, le, yeah, today. When was the last time you told a kid when you really screwed up? Kids need to hear that you too really screw up. I'll tell you one story. A number of years ago, I was driving the kids, my youth group, up on a retreat. We were in one of those vans I was talking about. I was tired. It was Friday night. You know, it's Friday at the beginning of the retreat. You're supposed to be up. I was down. And the kids were loud. And it was raining. And we were late. My youth group's always late. <laughs> Driving. Last thing I needed that night was a flat tire. Bang! Right, you're out there on the rain. And, and I wish I could tell you people that I calmly and coolly got out of the van. <laughs> and while singing praise tunes written by David Crowder, <laughs> I changed that tire. I'll tell you something, man. I can't tell you that. I got out of the van, and I lost it. I mean, I, I was yelling. I was swearing, cursing. I punched the van. I and, you know, I ripped my pants. I got all messy. You know, you're trying, you got the jack, and it, it slipped, and I barked my knuckles and everything and I mean I just lost it by the time I was like I hate it shut up or you can shut up <laughs> nobody says anything till we get there <laughs> I mean I, I you know and I was so embarrassed 
We got up to the camp, kids went to bed. By the next morning, I kind of regained my composure, but man, my reputation was shot. <laughs> All weekend long, kids coming up, bat, pat me on the shoulder going, Bart, man, you lost it. <laughs> That was a good thing. I wasn't the speaker on this retreat. And that was a good thing, you know, because, you know, I'm glad. No, man, I, I was disqualified. I mean, we, we made it through. We made it through. My kids were really good. They hung with the other kids. Everything was good. The speaker was good. Everything was all right. And at the end of the weekend, you know, when the speaker gave the invitation, a number of kids in my youth group came forward and accepted Christ. It was kind of, you know, and they do that on retreats. It's beautiful. No, I mean, they do. That's why you go on retreats. We got home. A couple weeks later, I was, I was hanging out in my house. One of these kids came by. And he came by. He said, I just came by to let you know I, I accepted Jesus on the retreat too. And I, I was like, are you serious? He said, yeah, I accepted Jesus. I, I mean, I didn't know. You, I mean, you know what that's like. When, when you find out a kid has come to Christ, when you find out that his life started, he made a decision. I mean, I was just so excited. I said, wow. I said, on the retreat. He said, yeah. I said, what, what was it? Was it the speaker? Was it the quiet times? Was it the fellowship with all the kids? What was it? He said, no, man. He said, it was when you lost it on the highway. I said, I said what? He said, man, I figured if you could be a Christian, anybody could. think God can only use our perfection and the truth is that God uses your reality when you're real you're dangerous when the father says Lord I believe help thou my unbelief Jesus says all right then all right and then he rebuked the evil spirit he said you deaf and mute spirit I command you come out of him and never enter him again now, people say there's no humor in the Bible. People say there's no contradictions in Scripture. I, I don't know what they're talking about. You got, a deaf, you got a deaf and mute spirit, so why are you talking to him? <laughs> Next verse. The spirit shrieked. I thought he was mute. Spirit shriek, convulsed him violently and came out. Came out. Spirit came out. You want to know why the spirit came out? Because whether your faith is strong or weak, your Jesus still has authority over evil spirits. You don't save them, you bring them to Jesus. Your faith, your brilliance, your spiritual goodness, your righteousness, that isn't what saves kids. It's your Jesus that saves them. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And Jesus helped that man's unbelief by doing a miracle right in front of his face. And Jesus is using you to do amazing miracles. Yeah. Yeah. Problem is, after he saved a kid, the boy still looked like a corpse. The boy looked so much like a corpse, says the Bible, that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. So that's the thing about Jesus, is after he heals him, he lifts him up. See, he's a little like Lazarus, remember? After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, then he said, what? Let's take those graves, let them go now. See, the miracle isn't done when you got, you got to, the miracle isn't done when you, when you save a young person. The miracle isn't done when you heal a young person. There's more to do. Time to lift them up. Time to let them go. You got some young people in this room that have been saved. And the rest of us, we, we, but they still haven't emerged. They've been healed. But they're still bound up. Older youth workers, your job 
is not just to get kids saved, but once they've been saved, to lift them up, to put them in positions of leadership. I know they'll take the ministry in places you don't think it's going to go. It's all right. You took it in places people didn't want it to go to. I don't have, I don't have any kind of fancy saying for you to go away with. I don't have one of those, take it up, take it up. I don't have that. I don't do that. Here's what I'm here to tell you. I'm convinced that the biggest problem with urban youth workers in this country is that they suffer from a chronic sense of inadequacy and low self-esteem. That they don't believe that God can use them in huge and important and powerful ways because we all suffer from this crazy sense that we're not spiritual enough, that we're not good enough, that our faith isn't strong enough, that we're not as good as the speakers, we're not as good as the seminar leaders, we're not as good as the other youth workers. And I'm just here to tell you, that God can do amazing things through your reality and who you really are. God is doing amazing things, and God will do amazing things if you just, if you just believe. Soren Kierkegaard's the greatest philosopher in the world as far as I'm concerned. He also told really funny stories. Soren Kierkegaard tells a story. He says uh, there was a village of ducks, and uh, in the village of ducks, they, uh, they all lived in the duck town, and they all lived in duck houses. And they went to duck jobs, and they worked. They drove around in duck cars. And every Sunday morning, all the ducks woke up, and they put on their Sunday duck best outfits. And they, and they, they combed their feathers, and they, got their, they, they, they picked up their Sunday duck Bibles, and they, they waddled out into the street and they waddled down the street and they waddled into the duck church. And they waddled down the aisles in the duck church and then they got in the pews and they squatted. And then, and then the duck minister came up in the duck pipe, pulpit and he opened the duck Bible and he read to the ducks. And he said to them, ducks, ducks, you have wings like eagles. And ducks, with these wings, you can soar. Ducks, because you have wings, you can fly higher than the eagles. You can soar. You can do great things, ducks. And all the ducks said, Amen, says Kierkegaard. And then they all waddled home. People, people, you serve a God who has authority over evil. You serve a God who says all things are possible for those who believe. You serve a God who doesn't need perfect people to do his perfect will, who uses Losers like us. You're involved in the most important ministry in the world. People, you can do great things for Jesus. You can emerge from the tradition. You don't have to stay in the church with the kids you already have. You can take those kids out and you can save the world. You can do all things. People of God, you have wings. You can soar like eagles. Don't waddle home in the name of Jesus. Emerge.